The Physician's Road. Create your life in medicine, on your own terms. Today, we are on the path to wealth. The Physician's Road is brought to you by Vernonville Asset Management. Vernonville Asset Management was created to help physicians build wealth and create income beyond Wall Street. Through our exclusive private investments, doctors can begin to free themselves from the burdensome regulations in healthcare by creating income streams independent of medicine. Go to IncomeBeyondWallStreet.com to get your free report, Wall Street's Biggest Lie. Again, go to IncomeBeyondWallStreet.com to get Wall Street's Biggest Lie and free yourself today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Physicians Road podcast. Today, we're back on the path to wealth. And I'm so happy to have a friend and colleague, David Babinski from True North Resources, here to speak with us today. This is a great podcast for me personally, because um, what David's firm does is something that I've been looking for for our, for my, for our investors probably for the past four, four and a half years. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today are some very advanced and high level tax saving strategies and tax mitigation strategies that anyone can employ. So this doesn't matter if, you are, if you're a W-2 wage earner, so you can be employed and still take advantage of these tax saving strategies, as well as being either a 1099 um, person or a business owner or, or a practice owner. And so I'm happy to have David. It's been a long time in coming um, in terms of um, finding a company like his who does these in the way that I think are um, the best way to do them and in the way in which the IRS can, 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 can approve them. Um, so much so that, that True North has become a sponsor of uh, the Physicians Road, and we brought them on to help us um, help a lot of our investors in the process. So without further ado, I want to introduce Dave, David Babinski uh, from True North Resources. Um, so David, give us a little bit about your background and, and about the company um, kind, of, c- kind of from the beginning. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. I appreciate you having me on the podcast today. Uh, you know, a little bit about myself. I started in financial advising uh, 1993. So if you, you do the math there, it's, it's been a long time. Uh, just like a lot of uh, advisors back in the day, we were trading stocks and options and, you know, got into full-fledged financial planning, worked in retirement planning for probably a decade, helping people retire. And I just saw all of the inefficiencies of how retirement accounts were set up and things were, you know, not really the way they should be by the time people got to retirement. And it, I really made the realization that it's all about the taxes. You know, when you think about it, there's companies that set up their entire structure around taxes. You know, most uh, individuals, they go through their working years thinking that, you know, making that contribution to the IRA is the end all be all and they've maximized taxes. And it's, it's much more complex than that. So, you know, when I um, first started learning about this concept of a conservation easement and I saw how effective that was in controlling taxes, you know, went in with both feet and, you know, the rest is kind of history. And that's where, where true North comes in because like you said, not only is this effective, effective for our business owners, it's really, you know, super powerful for someone who's got a W2. So, you know, in a nutshell, true North is a traditional real estate developer. You know, we look at every project like any other real estate developer would do it, but because of our extensive tax background, we're also able to you know, calculate what the savings would be if that project was put into a conservation easement, thereby passing on a substantial tax benefit to our investors. So, you know, un, uh, you know, unlike your traditional real estate developers just going to build that building or that subdivision, we actually run a couple of different scenarios, uh, the highest and best use, which we'll talk about. We also run the scenario, what if we land bank our projects and just let them sit and grow? What would they natural sprawl due to our value. But then third, which makes us different, is we do put all the steps in place and run the numbers on what the benefit of a conservation easement would be. Great. And what I appreciate about that process is you're essentially taking, and this is what we like to do here at the Physician's Road, is you're taking what has has traditionally been um, the strategies that only the super wealthy have been able to employ and be able to bring it down to the common person who's a... and when I say common, yes, most of us who are listening have fairly high incomes. But what I mean, the common person is we don't have an army of lawyers and accountants on call, standby at the ready to set these things up for us. 
um, you're able to help individuals do this as well. And that really very much fits within the ethos of what we're trying to accomplish here with the Physicians Road and, and with many of our listeners. So you use a yeah, term. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, you don't have to be a family office or you don't have to have that army of professionals on your situation. We'll take care of that, you know, on our side. And then you could just come on in. Just like you said, it fits exactly with what you're doing with your other projects. And so let's talk a bit about conservation easements, use that term. So let's, what, what is that exactly? So let's assume people who are listening have no idea, they haven't heard this, or they may have heard some things about it, which we'll get into in a second, but what is it and kind of how do they work? Right. Well, so a conservation easement is really, uh, you know, it's nothing new. You know, people have been conserving land for hundreds of years and then the tax benefit was added, you know, in the, in the early seventies to incentivize taxpayers to do this. You know, the, the politicians realized that, you know, as the country was growing, the sprawl was becoming, you know, fairly uncontrollable and, and the government just didn't have the resources, you know, to continue to, to make places, national parks. And, you know, you can only have so many central parks, you know, with public money. So they incentivized the taxpayer and said, hey, if you've got land that has conservation value, you know, relatively natural habitat, you know, big open spaces, you can get a sizable tax deduction if you were to place an easement on that. And really, so a conservation easement is simply an agreement between a, a group of landowners and either a land trust or government entity to preserve those conservation values. Basically, you're saying we will not develop, we will not mine, we will not, you know, whatever that highest and best use is, you're going to put that to the side for the main purpose of preserving, you know, the creek, the fish, the owl, the tree, the plant, you know, whatever it is that has that conservation value, uh, you know, for that particular piece of property. Got it. And so would it easy? So you're saying this was built out of the 70s. So I would assume that's when the nascent environmental movement was really born. And the, the whole so this really was a way for the government to incentivize. And remember, I, we always talk about the tax code is just a set of incentive structures. So this is really a way for the government to incentivize private industry to be a part of the conservation movement and be a part of the envir environmental movement. Would that be fair to say? That's, that's exactly it. You know, this isn't some gray area or private letter, letter ruling or, you know, something offshore. This is right in the IRS code 170 H, uh, you know, just at, like making any other charitable contribution, uh, except for we have a little bit of a twist that we'll get into on how they value the, you know, what you're giving up in this easement. All right. And so before we get into those weeds, let's let's take the pivot to what we know everyone is, is talking about. So if you Google these things, kind of the IRS and how the IRS feels about these. Right. And so most people will say, well, the IRS hates these. You're going to get audited. They're going to disallow it. All of those kind of things. So let's walk through kind of from you all standpoint, because you all are deep in the industry. Right. Right. Walk right, through so, how what that looks like from from the industry standpoint and, and what the IRS is saying about it. Yeah, let me just give you, you know, the, the behind the curtain view, you know, as you can appreciate any program that gives, you know, a massive tax benefit is going to be subject to, you know, bad actors. You know, I don't, I don't care if you're a physician prescribing opioids, you know, when there's an incentive, uh, there's always people that push the envelope, right? So there's going to be bad actors is the point. So, you know, we realize that this is in the IRS crosshair. So when we're building our files, we're going to purposely construct those files with the anticipation of an IRS audit. So we are under the assumption of a 100% audit rate. Now, that's not our experience, but we're under that assumption. And really, why the IRS has come down so hard on these is because there has been some unrealistic claims about what's been given up. So I'll give you an example. For every dollar you put into a program, you know, you're going to get some leverage benefits, some leveraged charitable deduction. Well, the average in the industry was nine to one. So you know anything about math, you know, average is one thing. So if you put a dollar in, the average deduction was $9. Well, the biggest, we're not the biggest, but the biggest providers in the industry last year were at four, 4.2. We were at 4.5. So think, think about this for a second. If, if the biggest players in the industry are four, four and a half times what you put in as a deduction when you ultimately, you know, go through the system, and the average was nine. We've heard 
categories of sponsors or individuals claiming 20 to 1, 30 to 1, even 50 to 1. So that's unrealistic. And that's what puts it in the in the IRS's crosshairs. You know, if you put in a ten thousand dollar, you know, investment and you claim a five hundred thousand dollar deduction, you're going to raise some eyebrows. So the IRS has come down hard, saying we are going to look at two things: the technical aspects of your program. They're going to look for a reason to throw it out, and they're also looking at the appraisal or the valuation and say that you pass the technical audit, which is the first phase, then they're going to say, well, how did you do your appraisal? And can we give you a little bit of a haircut? And that's what they're looking for right now. We know that. And how do we know that? There's a guide. It's called the Conservation Easement Audit Techniques Guide. They send their auditors out with this guide, and it's basically a roadmap for us. So we make sure you know, that we check off all the boxes that they're going to look at. You know, the business plan has to be a fully developed business plan. The appraisals, we use MAI certified. Uh, you know, we do an environmental baseline study. Like if you don't have environmental, you know, conservation values, it's not going to hold mustard with, with the IRS. So really where it all stemmed from, when you think about the, the adjustment we went through during the Great Recession, there was a lot of real estate projects on the drawing board that were, you know, penciling to make a lot of money. The crash hit. And then, they, and then some people said, you know what, Let's just put an easement on this. And they claimed, you know, the deduction for that, for that profit they could have made pre pre crash and the IRS came in and said, no, that, that looks a little inflated. So that was kind of the impetus of why it's been in the crosshairs, just some aggressive valuations that the IRS uh, is examining. But, you know, we avoid that by keeping everything, you know, very conservative and right in line with, with what, what our business plan is. And we'll get into the weeds in a minute, but, but that's in, in a nutshell. Well, actually, let's get into the weeds. That's exactly what I want to do because you use some terms. I want to make sure that the uh, that the audience can can follow on. And so you talked about kind of abusive. And so one, you talked about leverage. So one to fifty, one to four point five. So if just to make sure I understand it in my own head, if if someone were to say I'm going to put a hundred thousand dollars into a program, and someone is saying that okay, it's it's a four point five to one or one to four point five, they would be getting a deduction of. Four hundred and fifty thousand dollars on their tax rolls, up to a up to a point which you will talk to in terms of their adjusted gross income. Is that what the how it works? Do I have that correctly? Yeah. So let's take just one little step back and talk about where does that come from. So you know, there's a couple of things I want you to keep in mind, right? When they're talking about this deduction and this levered levered deduction, it's because. So so let's just think about this in theory. We have a piece of land, right? We, in our case, we're, we're mining granite. So we, we suspect but don't know that there's granite on this land. So we run through the entire business plan. So this is our highest and best use. We send out a geologist to drill test holes. We have it examined. We're going to look for not only quality but quantity. And an entire business plan is going to be developed. So that's the impetus of all of this and what we're about to talk about. What is the highest and best use of the property? So in our case, like I said, we've got some beautiful property in Georgia and South Carolina that's very rich with minerals. We run a business plan. It's about a 1500 page document that says we can mine this. And I'm just going to make up a number and say, you know, we can make a $20 million profit. So unlike if you were going to donate, say you had a boat, you know, that was a big pain in the, in, in the butt and it was worth a hundred thousand. You can't sell it. You're sick of maintaining it. Well, you could donate that to Bone Angels and you'll get your hundred thousand dollar deduction. Well, in a conservation easement option, when we donate the land, we get a deduction based on the present value of that future profit. So that's why the four and a half to one comes in, because we're not giving up the use of the land. We're giving up the economic you know, incentive. We're giving up our profit. And the IRS allows us to take that lost development value or that, or that entrepreneurial profit all in one year. So, you know, to answer the question you just asked, you have to understand we're not just donating, you know, you write a check to the Boys and Girls Club for $10,000, you get a $10,000 deduction. We're giving up the right to go into business and we're preserving that land in perpetuity. That's where that leverage comes from. So think about it. If we were going to make, say, $20 million in one of our mines and our total project cost is, say, four or four and a half million, that gives us the, the ratios. Now, can you imagine if we were going to invest $4 million? And then we were able to take a $200 million deduction. It just isn't, isn't reasonable. And that's why the IRS has their feathers, you know, all ruffled over this is because there are people just throwing 
you know, uh, very inflated uh, appraisals. And that's what they're talking about when they say that, you know, they're, they're claiming they could have made astronomical profits. Uh, and that's what they're challenging. Got it. And so for the person listening, if you're looking at these kind of conservation easements, what we're trying to do is give you the correct questions to ask so you understand from the baseline, the rationale behind why this exists in the tax code. And so from that standpoint, you want that, that, that term, the present value of future profit, right? What is being given up to not develop a project, right? That's the question you want to make sure that you're able to answer if you look at one of these types of projects um, that someone is offering you to find out if it's reasonable, right? If, they, if it passes the smell test, right? Could the person, could the sponsor, could your team have really made the amount of money above what you are going to be putting in from the beginning standpoint of it, right? And so you talked about technical aspects versus appraised value. So we kind of went through the appraised value. What are technical aspects? So someone it can be asking a, a potential sponsor, what what is that technical aspects of the program mean exactly? So yeah, that's the first thing the IRS is going to look at. So real basic, the property has to be owned by the partnership for at least a year and a day. So you have to deal with the long-term asset. You can't just identify a property, put an easement on it and take a deduction. So, you know, in our case, we're working on projects right now in the, in the back office that won't see the light of day until 2021, possibly 2022. So, you know, it's very uh, complex how these technical aspects are. Kate. So, you know, it can't just be, you you really want to be careful of someone who this is the only one they've done or if they're kind of new and it's the, you know, we just bought the land. So very technical, you know, is how the, the property is owned and how long it's been owned. But that business plan is so important. You have to be able to prove, like you said. So let's talk about that. We're at four and a half to one. We're mining granite. We've got a 1500 page business plan that says we can make, you know, X amount of dollars over 18, 20, 25 years. Well, if you run the math on that, that's about a 14 or 15 IRR, right? So our, if we go into the mining business, we're giving our clients basically a 14% annual return on their money. That's very reasonable for a private placement type investment. As a matter of fact, some people would say, you, you know, it's, it's extremely defensible. Now, that same, you know, deduction at 20 to one or 50 to one, when you run the math, that would be like saying our business could have made 40%, 50%, 60% IRRs over long periods of time. Well, well, Eric, you and I would say, well, let's go do that business. Why would we, you know, why would we donate that when we can make that kind of money? Well, it's because it's not, you know, it's not feasible. So very technical aspect is that business plan. Now the appraisals come into play because they are going to challenge that appraisal. And like I said, we only use MAI, which is the Appraisal Institute certification. That is the equivalent of, you know, a doctorate in appraisals. Okay. So that's the highest level appraisal certification, but because we know that's the weak point, that's the, the, the point of failure. Not only do we have the appraisal done, then we have a second independent appraiser come in, not for a second appraisal, but to do a review of the first appraisal. So now we have two experts that could defend that appraisal that have looked at it ahead of time. Uh, another important aspect is that there has to be a, a relationship with the land trust. The law specifically states that you have to hold this in perpetuity. So you can't just name, you know, Farmer Bob to be the custodian of this, the steward. It's got to be someone who has reasonable expectations to be in existence long after you're gone. So the land trust is important. And then the most important technical aspect is that baseline study. Like in our case, we have a biologist go out and you know, it's kind of sounds uh, quirky, but they pitch a tent, they walk the perimeter of the land, and from two to 14 days, they live on that land and they catalog at dawn, at dusk, midday, middle of the night, and they're looking for everything from, you know, obviously natural habitat, what's in and out of there. They're looking at the plants, they're looking at the trees, they're looking at water, uh, you know, water uh, flows, and they are categorizing every single aspect that is going to be, you know, preserved. And then really technically, when it boils right down to it, you know, when you look at the, what's physically possible, so the IRS is going to say, you know, here's the requirements uh, of, you know, that they're going to look at physically possible, legally permissible, financially feasible, and maximally productive. So those are the tests that they're going to look at. So if somebody comes in and they say, well, I've got an acre of land on a marina in Miami, 
and I'm going to build a 220 story building. Well, that's, that's not physically possible, right? You're, you're just making numbers on a page add up to some, you know, arbitrary number and they're going to test. Was it physically possible? So that's the first thing. Is it legally permissible? You know, you say, Oh, the, the best use of this land is a landfill. Well, well you never would have got that approved. So you can't deduct, you know, the profit of that, you know, financially feasible. Do you have the mobilization money? If your investors vote to go do that project, is it, and you actually pull it off and then maximally, maximally productive is actually the one that's in our favor. They want us to find highest and best use to make sure that, you know, when we go for that deduction, we do, you know, memorialize what it is we're giving up. So that was a long winded answer, but you know, it is, there's a lot of technicalities and it takes years before we bring a project out to our investors to make sure that all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. No, no, those technicalities are what we want to have, right? Because people are, pe people have been scared from being a part of these because they assume everyone who's in the industry is, is essentially a shyster, right? And so giving people the knowledge, that's the whole point of the podcast is to give the people the yeah. knowledge to be able to ask the correct questions. We didn't start in the weeds, but I, I like to start at the top and then go into the weeds because we have a lot of engineers who listen, right? And there's some people who want to know those technical details because if someone puts a project in front of you, you now have a checklist to go down and say, D are these things being met? And does the team that's putting these together have this understanding and expertise to be able to do that? So while it was long winded and why it was very technical, I think it was very helpful for someone to be able to go back and listen to it, rewind it and get those check marks off of this to understand what this should and should not look like. And so let's talk about kind of the downsides. So let's just say the IRS comes in and, and does an audit and dis disallows. What's the worst case scenario in that process? In that, in that, if that would have well, happened? If that were the case, if they actually, they, they would love to just throw the program out, right? And we've seen instances where they've done that because of a technical violation, right? Even if you, so there's an order of things and they find a technical violation. Uh, the, the worst case scenario would be, you know, they have a three year window to audit. So they usually wait till the 35th or 36th month to, you know, to put you under audit. And then it takes, say, another year or so to go through the process. They throw that program out and you took a deduction, say, in 2015. They're going to go back and want you to amend and you're going to pay interest and penalties since 2015. And, and, and of course, the tax that, that you should have paid if, if you didn't have this program. So that you said, what's the worst case? Now, in our experience, you know, for about 10 years, we've been involved in this industry of 108 projects to date. Very early on, one of the projects that was audited, and, and we've had nine audited, but very early on, one of the projects that was audited, they actually had some issues with the appraisal and there was a 10% discount offered by the IRS. They said, you claimed $100, we only want to allow you to claim 90 uh, it just seemed reasonable to just stop the, you know, the fight. So the, you know, the sponsors at the time just agreed to that haircut since then. And, and they've learned from that. The next eight audits that we've been, been involved with, no change from the IRS, every uh, deduction stood just as it was written. And then, you know, out of the hundred and some odd programs, you know, the hundred that weren't audited, you know, just stood the way they are. So that's our experience, like one out of 10 and then were audited, and then one out of those 10, actually there was even the slightest of adjustments. But that tells you the IRS is looking at these and done correctly, you know, it's not, oh, we caught you, you're doing an easement, it's thrown out. You know, out of 108 programs, one had a 10% haircut to what was, uh, what was deducted. Got it, okay, well, that's, that. well, you, you laid out the stats, right? So people can do their own math from that standpoint. And so explain, to the audience, I'm going to kind of let you promote yourself at this point, right? Okay. Um, explain why you guys are different than what is what typically happens in the industry. Well, I think the, the biggest difference is that, you know, we are uh, coming from the standpoint of the financial business, right? We're not, you know, per se, a, a developer that said, well, I've got a failed project or something that's being hard to finance. So let me just see if I can rustle up some people who need it. You need a tax deduction. So we're coming at this, you know, it's a team of lawyers, CPAs, financial advisors, you know, our programs are registered with FINRA and they're offered through broker dealers. So there's levels of regulatory scrutiny that you won't find in a lot of private placement type investments. So that gives us 
you know, candidly, it just gives us a, a step up that, you know, it's, it's uh, been looked at from many, many different angles. And then the fact that we know the IRS code so well, you know, we do a lot of other tax strategies with our clients. But, you know, the reason you and I spoke about this is, you know, you had a lot of W-2 wage earners that, you know, you're really getting the short end of the stick if you're a high income earning W-2. Because, you know, for our business owners, people who have a, you know, a Schedule C or, or you know, have their own LLC, we've got about 317 different things we could do to help you save in taxes. If you're a W-2, we've got like five right? And this is the most power, you know, you can only buy so many uniforms, right? And deduct it. So this is like the most powerful thing we have for, for someone who's a, a W-2. So yeah, the fact that we're coming at it from the standpoint of we're a real estate development company, but right from day one, we're selecting on our, you know, experience on our capital, we're drilling those core holes. We're doing those market studies before we even bring it to market. When, when we have a project come to market, it's been mock audited. It is, you know, basically spit shined and ready to go. Got it. And, it. and it also seems that you all are in the mining side of things when most of this is just kind of traditional real estate. Do you have well, any you thoughts know, around that? Yeah. So highest and best use is highest and best use, right? We're not, we're not afraid of development deals. But on the mining side, we feel, you know, the IRS comes in and audits it and says, well, you said you were going to make $20 million. You've got so many metric tons. We, we, it's there go check, right? It wasn't like, oh, we were going to build 500 houses and, you know, they all would have sold at a premium and they could argue with that, right? Oh, the economy changed and you could never have built them in the time. And, and so development is what could have been, you know, no pun intended, but we're standing on solid ground, right? Length times width times height times the market value of that asset. We've got a true commodity that you can feel touch. When we have those core holes taken out of the ground, a third party, uh, company goes and analyzes them and keeps them under lock and key. We never touch them. So we can pull those out, have a professional witness say, these are the exact samples. It was countertop grade or it was aggregate grade. Here's how deep it went. Here's what the market price was. Here's a buyer's order that says how much we could have sold that for right at that time. So it does give us a little bit more, you know, solid math as opposed to, like I said before, oh, we were going to build 40-story skyscraper and it would have sold out in two years. They start to challenge that. Well, the guy down the street, it took him three years, so you wouldn't have made as much profit. You would have had a discount. We just avoid all that. Not that there's anything wrong with a, a development deal. We just found that on the mining side, you know, the, the appraisal company we, we use has done over 140 appraisals on these type of projects, some of which went to mine because they needed it for their financing, and some of them went into conservation. Great. And then talk about a little bit how you protect your clients around kind of the, the, the audit process, kind of well, client we, gets a deal a lot and what do you do for them? Right. We covered a lot of that, but where the rubber hits the road, every one of our projects, we, uh, you know, assume it's going to be audited. But what you have to understand, you know, what your listeners want to understand is this particular, uh, you know, investment on the individual side, it's not going to trigger an audit on the personal level. Think about it. You get a K-1, from one of your investments and it's got numbers in, you know, boxes, you know, one through 12, one through 14, and it goes on your return. So if they audit your return, you either got the K1 or you did it, right? There's nothing for them to audit. Now it'll kick up to the sponsor level. So this in itself will not trigger an audit on the individual level. And most CPAs will tell you, oh, that's a red flag. Well, you either got the K1 or you didn't, right? You're going to file a form 8283, just like you would if you made a, you know, a contribution to a church or to a, uh, a church organization and you're going to have, you know, the information from us that you made that, you know, that contribution. So all that's going to be in order. We handle all that. But then how do we actually protect against that audit? On the sponsor level, we have a very large war chest for audit reserve. As a matter of fact, each program this year is going to have $1.2 million uh, of coverage if we end up getting audited. Now, why is that important? The IRS is looking for people who are aggressive, first of all. But second of all, they're really targeting people who can't candidly can't afford to defend. You know, when they say that we've got this big war chest per uh, project, they tend to, you know, go in, they look at it. Okay. Everything's in order. 1500 page business plan. We've got the double, uh, you know, checked appraisal. We've got a baseline report from, you know, colleges from, you know, major universities that are then going to be part of the land trust that's going to steward that land. 
all those technical aspects are the first line of defense, but having that cash in the bank, we're ready to go and we will defend these audits. You know, I, I usually, you know, I'm reluctant to say this, but you know, we've got a 116 acre project that we're claiming the, you know, charitable deduction as if we're going to mine 32 of those acres. I'm just going to say this little tongue in cheek, take it for what it's worth. If we get audited on these projects, we hundred percent expect to get an increased deduction because we're so conservative with how we do our, you know, our, you know, we're not going the whole 116 acres is going to be audited and here's how much we're going to make. We just take the sweet spot in the middle. It meets our numbers. And if we get audited and we need to drill the rest of that property, we would fight. And the last audit we heard similar to this, they actually did get an increase through the audit process of what their deduction was. Now we're not going to say that, you know, normally, but it just came to mind when you, when you asked me about it, you know, how do we protect it? We're just, you know, belts and suspenders. We've got this thing covered. Got it. Perfect. And then there's also around the amount you can actually take around your adjusted gross income. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So this is subject to, you know, itemized deductions. So it's anyone who's got a schedule A, you know, like a, a perfect example of a limit would be state and local taxes. You know, for those that are in states that, uh, you know, have an income tax, you're traditionally could deduct that against federal. Well, they now limit that at $10,000. It's called the SALT. Well, we have a similar limitation, although it's much more generous. 50%, half of your AGI can be reduced through a conservation easement, a non what is, what is, charitable deduction. What does AGI mean? Yeah, adjust, so adjusted gross income. Yeah, sorry about that. I, we get into the jargon. So the adjusted gross income on your tax return, that's the, the bottom line number on the front page. So after you've taken your real estate depreciation, after you added your business income, your interest, your dividends, your wages. So that's what, you know, they call it adjusted because you can take, you know, all the other little tricks of the trade before you take your standard or itemized deduction. So after your retirement plan contribution, after, you know, everything, that's what they call adjusted gross income, AGI. Then we're able to take half of that on schedule A towards what this is a non-cash charitable contribution. So Got it's it. the, the same limitation you'd have if you were writing a check to, you know, the uh, Humane Society and taking a deduction. They, they limit it to 50% of your adjusted gross income. Okay. So that is a, that is a charitable deduction limit irrespective of what the charity is. Correct. Correct. We're just Got part it. of it. So if you already have charitable uh, uh, contributions on the board, we would back those out of our optimization calculation. Now, say we were wrong and, and you put a little extra in and you were limited. This particular uh, program, it does have a carve out. You could carry forward this deduction for 15 years, one five, 15 years until it's used up. So it's quite generous uh, of Congress because they allowed a tremendous amount of time. And again, that you, you like to, what was the, what was the motivation? You know, picture the rancher, the farmer, they donate their property. They never want to, they see the sprawl coming. They want to keep it, you know, for generations. They, they can't write that off in one year. So they give them 15 years to roll that forward. Got it. And so someone coming in, um, you would run these calculations for people um, in terms of when they contact you, in terms of what they can do on a yearly basis? That's right. We would want to optimize it because you never, just like anything, you don't want to tie up more money than you have to. So we would run the optimization you know, like I said, what, you know, are you ahead of last year? Are you a little behind? Where do you stand with what you think your income is going to be? Any long-term capital gains? Cause we've got to do a separate calculation for those itemized deductions, any care reports. So just those four things, then we could give an optimal uh, recommendation, which would then estimate what the potential savings would be. Got it. And someone would just need to be able to show you what the prior year's tax return, your W-2, those kind of things? That's it. We just need to know the number. And like I said before, the biggest thing is, you know, do you have any charitable, you know, deductions already in the pipe that you're going to take this year? Because we would get those out. And then you talked about um, retirement accounts, retirement tax planning. You all have a novel um, way to, to that pairing a conservation easement with some tax deferred money. Talk a little bit about kind of a novel strategy that many people can use who have tax deferred money um, in accounts. Yeah, sure. So this is the basis of why, you know, why we exist, because we're not just talking about, you know, uh, uh, executable products, right? We're talking about complex strategies. So, you know, a lot of people uh, are accumulating tremendous amount of money in their retirement plans. And, and, and you and I talk about this, you know, when somebody's looking at one of your real estate programs, you have the option to have them invest with their IRA. Well, when you think about it, when you stop and think about it, if you're gonna double or triple 
maybe even twice over your lifetime, your IRA balance. Why would you do that inside of a tax deferred vehicle? You know, your $2 million IRA is going to grow to nine, but you still owe tax on that nine. Why wouldn't you convert that to a Roth? Make your invest investments in a Roth. Well, the, well, the answer is your CPA says, well, it's going to kill you in taxes today. Well, if you create that taxable event, but then you could mitigate that through an increase in how much you put in an easement, we've got people just straight line converting IRA money to Roth for 22 cents on the dollar. And then we do have a more novel uh, uh, double discount, I call it, where we actually have people converting money to a Roth that costs them 13 cents on the dollar. Now, it's very technical. I have an entire hour webinar on this. Uh, but basically, what it comes down to is convert into a Roth before you start investing in these high return investments, pay the tax out of money that's not inside your IRA. And then just like any other income that hits your tax return, you can use an easement to offset, you know, 50% of that. So, you know, we have an entire division that all we do is calculate Roth conversions. And sometimes it takes five years, seven years, you know, because there's optimal, you know, optimal strategies to do that. Got it. And so just to take a step back, essentially what we're talking about is doing a Roth conversion and pairing it with a conservation easement to lighten the tax um, load in the process. And so that if you take nothing else away from what we just said, that is the process. You can discuss that with David kind of on the, on the outside of things, um, kind of in a, in a consultation, if that is something that, that kind of resonates with you. And so before we wrap up, because the hour is long and intentions are short, uh, is there anything I didn't ask you about that you want to make sure that the audience knows um, before we get out of here? You know, a couple of things I think I would want to finish with. This type of a strategy, you know, the real estate investment with the conservation option is available to anyone who pays taxes. So it's, it's effective for the people in the highest three tax brackets. So if you're, you know, 32, 35, 37% tax brackets, you know, that's 160,000 individual to 320 uh, for married filing joint. Above that, it starts to become very effective. But it's also effective if you have a state that charges, you know, an income tax. And there's 31 states that charge income tax that do allow for this type of deduction. So again, it's not just like, oh, this is a catch-all, you know, conservation easement at the end. There's some sh planning strategies we can use. The other place where it's very effective, if somebody does have a business or does get some 1099 income, they're consulting or speaking or something like that, and they there's a, a new benefit, you know, in the in the tax act called QBI or 199A, qualified business income, where you get a little extra deduction. Well, most people phase out, right? Over 315,000 phases out. A conservation easement charitable deduction could bring you back in to QBI range. So not only do you get the deduction on your Schedule A for the conservation easement, you also then get the QBI or, or 199A deduction. So it's a little technical, but if you're a business owner, your CPA won't even mention QBI because you're, you know, you're five, six, seven hundred thousand, you're phased out a long time ago. We could pull you back in. And then, you know, like I said, it's available to any state, but it's very effective if you're in, say, California, New York, you know, Minnesota, Oregon. These are very high tax states, 10% and higher, that we can also take the deduction on a state level. Got it. And so, and, and that's, I didn't even think about that, right? Because um, we talk about that on the captive insurance side. So essentially what you're saying is you can help people get it to the QBI level by having the conservation easement, but they, but you can't do that in the past. Essentially, you need to be thinking about that now at this time of year. So you can understand how much you'll be putting aside into the conservation easement potentially that will get your, your income down below the 315 QBI phase out so that you're going into the new year with that from, from that standpoint. Is right. Let me just say one other thing about the timing. The, the law states that everything has to be in place by the 31st, but on a very practical level, this really needs to be done and decided by Thanksgiving. You know, once we get into December, you know, last year we sold out, we had seven programs last year. Uh, we passed $140 million of, of tax deductions to our, uh, our partners, our investors. And, you know, you know we, we, first of December, it's, it's almost, too late. So if it's something that you want to look at some of these more advanced planning strategies, you know, the sooner the better is what I would say. Got it. So Thanksgiving is when you really want to be kind of dialed in at this point is what you're saying. Right. Got it. Okay, perfect. And so 
I want to thank David Babinski for being with us today on the Physicians Road podcast. What we'll do is we're going to set up, David's going to create a, a, a handout for us that you can download and be able to get in contact with him to give more information about um, conservation easements in general and then how to get kind of in contact with him. So what you'll do is you'll go to the physiciansroad.com forward slash W2 savings with an S at the end. So the physiciansroad.com forward slash W2 savings with an S at the end. So please join us on our Facebook group um, where we talk more in depth about some of these topics and other topics just like this. Just go to Facebook, put in the Physicians Road and answer the questions and we'll add you in. Um, I interact personally in there so you can just ask me questions kind of on a one-on-one basis with no problem. Um, And so we want to thank you for listening to this episode of the, the Physicians Road podcast where you create your life in medicine on your own terms. Thanks, David. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you for listening to The Physician's Road, where you create your life in medicine on your own terms. Please go to thephysiciansroad.com and sign up for your free guides and resources.